changing the perception and safety around, hey, like having a, a nuke is actually good for my community. It, the fact that Indian, what is it, Indian Point in New York was a yeah. quarter of New York City's electricity, all carbon free. And they shut it down shut and it they down. put up natural right. gas. Progressive <laughs> New York, New York that's enlightened, you know, oh, climate change. We don't want fracking. Let's just cut 25% of our carbon, you know, like it, it just insanity, right? I, I think you have to change it at that level. And it doesn't matter what the people on the right think. It's like you got to get the people on the left to think that this is actually a sexy issue, right? It needs to be cool for people in Hollywood. There are all these startups now figuring out how to build as quickly as they possibly can. Because there's also this other challenge where if you can get that support, you then need to put it on a, a, a presidential candidate or congressional member, senator, who's like, all right, cool, I'm going to put all of my chips on the table for this thing that currently will take 10 to 15 years to come online. And so like, I do think that there needs to be that work from the the either, you know, entrepreneurial community or from, uh, you know, the people who are putting large reactors online to say like, look, when you're ready, we can actually get this up and running in five years or six years or something where you might actually reap the political rewards for, for bringing this thing online. Hey, everybody. We're here today joined by very special guests, Julia DeWall and Packy McCormick. Julia, Packy, welcome to Moment of Zen. Thanks. It's great to be here. Good to be here, Eric. We've just released our uh, podcast collaboration together, uh, Age of Miracles, uh, which is trying to nuke pill uh, our, our, um, our listeners. Um, Packy and Julia, why don't you give a brief background on how you became so interested um, and obsessed with 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 uh, nuclear energy and, and the opportunities it presents. Um, Packy, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so I was actually going to suggest we start with Julia because she's been at this longer longer than I have, and then we'll hop over to me. Sure, let's start with Julia. Well, it's been super fun, uh, Packy, working with you and Eric, our matchmaker here. Thank you for even introducing us with this idea to do this show right. together. Um, I mean, I, I got into nuclear about almost two years ago now. Um, it was actually right before the Ukraine war hit. I was working at SpaceX on getting Starlink into Ukraine. And all of the stuff I had read from Peter Zahan's book, uh, The Accidental Superpower, about Russia as an aggressor, it was like, oh, this is actually happening. It's like, I wonder if his stuff about natural resources and fossil fuels in particular being really important is also going to kind of play out here. And of course it did, right? We saw um, the energy crisis start to unfold. And that coincided with me reading Michael Schellenberger's book, Apocalypse Never, if you've heard of that one. Um, it's about it's about climate doomerism and how it's not serving us well at all. And we should just use the tools we have and, um, you know, get out of the doom cycle and do some stuff, including build nuclear. And his section on nuclear was definitely my first nuke pill, I guess. <laughs> and it kind of, again, it coincided with watching what was going on in Russia and Ukraine, and um, eventually what was gonna go on with Germany, where they were gonna continue to shut down their nuclear plants and bring coal plants back on, despite being one of the most climate-oriented countries. Um, so anyway, it, there was just so much so much there. Oh, hey, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, were just, we were just talking about how we got into this. Anyway, so then um, I wrote a piece, and then Packy really kindly po posted it in, um, in one of his great newsletters uh, end of last year. And we started chatting about nuclear, you know, so starting about a year ago, and then yeah, I'll let, I'll let Packy step in here. Yeah, so Julia's piece came in a great time. I mean, I think for so many people, seeing what was happening based out of, you know, coming from the, the war in Ukraine, but then the just insanity out of Germany shutting down uh, nuclear plants and, and turning on coal. Remember seeing on Twitter just all of the electricity prices spiking and thinking it was crazy that you removed this cheap, reliable baseload power. At the time, before I really started looking into nuclear, I was like, well, I kind of get it. Like, it's this unsafe thing where you have this waste that lasts forever. But like, I guess in times of desperation, you should probably like just stick with what you have at least. And then the more I researched, I read Julia's piece. Uh, I saw this incredible chart in Our World and Data, which we talk about on the show that like completely changed my mind, which is like, I'd always thought there was this trade off between safety and then like this cheap, reliable, potentially abundant energy source. And then you look at the deaths per terawatt hour, coal is at 33 deaths per terawatt hour. And then like you go all the way down right between wind and solar, 
they're like imperceptibly, imperceptibly different at the bottom. And it's 0 0.03 deaths per terawatt hour from nuclear. And so I was like, all right, what is going on here? And I read more and more, read uh, you know, Robert Zubrin's case for nukes and just continue to get more and more and more nuke-pilled. And the more that I've gotten into this, like one, I think we need more nuclear energy and I think it needs to compete uh, on costs and all of that to, to prove itself. But I also just think it's this like incredible microcosm of growth versus degrowth. That like this thing that has all of the facts on its side has been stopped for like almost ide ideological reasons. Uh, and so it, it got my kind of pro-progress brain uh, infected. Before we get into some of those uh, myths or misconceptions, Packy, why don't we zoom out and just talk about why, why we care so much about energy in the first place or kind of what's the right way to, to, to think about that? I mean, energy is at the base of kind of everything. Like I, I wrote a piece, I guess a year ago now, uh, where I talked about, you know, the fact that we've, we kind of had all of this progress for, you know, since the Industrial Revolution till the 1970s what the fuck happened in 1971. It's like this famous year where everything falls off. There's a million different explanations. One of the really good ones is there's this Henry Adams curve where we had been uh, increasing humanity's electricity consumption by 7% a year. And then that totally falls off in the early 1970s. That's from uh, Where Is My Flying Car, which is kind of this like techno optimist Bible. And so like that was kind of interesting that all of the things that, that sci-fi authors predicted in like the early 1900s to mid 1900s, all the stuff that was digital and took less than 10 kilowatts to, to power actually came true. Like a lot of that stuff came true. Some of it came more true than expected. Anything that took, I think it was 100 kilowatts or more, didn't come true. Like all this progress that we could have made if we had just kind of kept increasing electricity consumption just fell off a, a cliff. So that was that was a big one uh, for me. But you can look at it like a million different ways. If you look at countries that are energy rich versus countries that aren't and their human rights record, their economic record, like it is just very clear that consuming, producing, and consuming more uh, energy is is tied with all sorts of positive uh, benefits for for a country, for the world. Uh, and, and so I guess those are those are a couple of the points. But everywhere you look, like the more energy you consume, the better you do. Maybe just to throw in, um, I have brought this book up on the podcast before, but Ian Morris, Why the West Rules for Now, uh, Professor Stanford, and he, he basically takes a framework where he actually looks at um, specifically kind of Western civilization compared to China o over time. And the unifying kind of like metric that he uses is, is I think it's like joules per person or, or per capita. And, and the idea that um, when you saw kind of the, the height of the Roman Empire, as well as the height of the Han Chinese dynasty, that was kind of like a local maximum in terms of like energy per per capita. And then in, in Western Europe, you actually had this huge fall off on, on energy per capita. And it only until you, you got to the Industrial Revolution did you finally start to have it, one, even catch back up to China. Um, and then two, like just it, it goes vertical. Um, and so that that that's an interesting book if you just kind of even want to zoom out uh, broader and saying civilization moves forward because we figure out how to harness more energy, right? And and I think you guys have a great beginning of your your first episode of the podcast with Albert Wegener talking about just fire calories, like it, you're actually able to to move humanity forward because rather than chewing, you're you're actually letting the fire do the work um, to unlock those calories. So I, I I think it's it's a useful frame. And I think the EAC folks that we've had on the podcast before, we've talked about this idea of the Kardashev scale and the idea that like we, we should be 100x, 1000x the amount of energy per person, um, you know, to be able to just live our best lives. And unfortunately, society is run by a bunch of I don't know, Greta stands that think we, you know, using energy is sinful and we should we should use less energy and have fewer kids because energy is a finite resource in, in their perverted form of the world. I don't know. Right, what do you guys think about Greta? Like you, 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 our, our podcast, we, we need we need someone to kind of be pointing the finger at. Dan and I have a group chat. Uh, the group chat is called uh, Shut Up, Greta, Go to School. <laughs> um. <laughs> to be clear, Eric came up with the name of that title. I, I, I have never participated in that group chat. I was added to that group chat. That said, I think Greta, um, sad face Greta is is what I think of Greta herself. 
she's been in my mind a few times kind of throughout this whole thing. It feels like even over the past few weeks, we've woken up and everyone's like, oh, wait, maybe it was weird that everybody was listening to Greta for so long. Or, you know, like it's not everybody, but that that mind, that positive mind virus is, is spreading. Yeah, well, the 1970s, when you see that stagnation in, in our use, of, at least in the Western world, the U.S., um, that use of energy, I mean, that's when you basically had the environmental movement, right? That The 1970-something is the first Earth Day. You have all these NGOs. It becomes this um, maybe replacement, like religion replacement for a lot of people where they become really, really, really uh, kind of enthralled with all the environmentalism pieces, right? So whether it's using less energy, small is beautiful, you have a lot of that. And I think it's like we just haven't had any sort of other narratives besides environmentalism. Environmentalism, environmentalism means use less. And so now, Packy and I have talked a lot about this podcast that we're trying to do with Age of Miracles as being something that provides an alternative narrative because there really just hasn't been one. I mean, the EX stuff is, is probably there too, but um, super minority position, right? And, and narrative. Yeah, I think... Um... One other thing that happened in the 70s, obviously, is the, the uh, Israelis got invaded by a bunch of Arab, Arab countries in a surprise attack. And then the Arab countries embargoed the U.S. on oil. And I think it kicked off a cycle of us having a, a sense of scarcity around energy. And I think, I mean, Julie, I think this was in your piece, but just talking about how a lot of the innovation, you know, up until 1970, it's like, okay, we can use energy to do this. Like we can have a microwave, we can, you know, refrigeration, uh, freezer, like all, all these appliances, washing machine. And then 1973, oil embargo, Jimmy Carter, you have this big shift towards how can we make things energy efficient? And and there have been huge strides. And, and, and to be clear, energy efficiency is, is good, but I think it is a scarcity mentality. And it, it's almost like when you have a startup, like, you probably want to focus on growing top line because that's actually like growth is, is the thing to focus on. And then you have a secondary team that's like, how can we improve the unit economics here? And it seems like since the seventies, the kind of like shift has been, how do we squeeze more out of what we have rather than like, what, what, what is the last like universal kind of like kitchen appliance that, or home appliance that everyone has as a result of just cheap energy. Right. You know, you know who got it right though in the seventies is France. So you had Mesmer, who was the, um, I guess, president at the time. And he said, okay, we have this oil crisis. France doesn't have a lot of carbon products. We are going to build nuclear. And that's when they started their nuclear build out. And right now they are the country with the most percentage of their electric grid that is powered by nuclear energy. Uh, Eric, do you know what percentage it is? No, no, what is it? I'm, qu I'm quizzing you because I feel like maybe you know the least. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I it's do know between what, like what, what seventy and seventy five percent. Just going right for the jugular. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's super high, and and it was because of these decisions they made in the seventies, and they just went for it. And um, Packy and I debate this a bit in the show, but um, they did this with a nationalized, centralized uh, utility electric company, the um, EDF, I think, uh, and they are able to go ahead and just do this huge build out. Nixon had actually talked about doing this in the U.S., but it never happened. And of course, the build out that we've seen um, is really is much more decentralized. Right? It's it's individual utilities across the U.S. that have decided uh, to build power plants and they've you know funded them with some government support, but largely on their own and independently. And so we've had more of an organic build out than I think you know France deciding to make a real stand here. Yeah, there's also this interesting historical tidbit which I didn't realize, but which one of our guests, Rod Adams, talked about in particular, which is that. When the oil crisis hit, there had been a ton of enthusiasm for nuclear, a bunch of build outs and this assumption that the Henry Adams curve would continue and that we'd keep growing our demand for energy 7% a year. And then when that the oil crisis hit and people were stuck in line at the pumps and they started consuming more and they started consuming more electricity, less electricity and trying to conserve more, that demand kind of fell off the cliff there. And it left a lot of utilities that had ordered nuclear plants holding the bag. And so like, there is this environmental thing that is a huge contributor to the downfall of nuclear. But one of the things that was more interesting to me or as interesting that I didn't realize before was that there were all of these very economic reasons that utilities kind of from that point on had to pay $100 million that range to cancel their orders. And so nuclear there and then kind of throughout the history since when there have been these cost overruns and delays, nuclear has been called a utility killer because it can be so expensive. And there's these like huge, massive 10, 15 year projects that if they go wrong, can really crush the, 
the utility that orders them. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Compliance doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, with Vanta, it can be super simple. Trusted by over 5,000 fast-growing companies like Chili Piper, Patch, Gusto, and Juniper, Vanta automates the pricey, time-consuming process of prepping for SOC 2, ISO 2701, HIPAA, and more. With Vanta, you can save up to 400 hours and 85% of costs. Vanta scales with your business, helping you successfully enter new markets, land bigger deals, and earn customer loyalty. And bonus, our Moment of Zen listeners get $1,000 off Vanta. Just go to vanta.com slash zen. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com slash Z-E-N. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamline accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash zen. That's netsuite.com slash zen to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash zen. I want to get get get, get into 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 why n- nuclear stalled so much of the, the biggest contributors. But first, let, let's just zoom out for a little bit of one hundred and one. In the first episode, you, you talk about some of the myths um, or misconceptions pe- people have about nuclear. Can you can you give us a little a little bit of one hundred and one and and unpack some some of those myths? Yeah, sure. You know, I love the, I love the nuclear waste one. This is one that um, I actually attended some of the California state hearings about Diablo Canyon. And um, there's actually also a moratorium on building new nuclear in California. And a Republican uh, decided to go for it with a bill to uh, get rid of that moratorium last year. Um, He obviously did not even make it out of committee with that. All of the Democrats, you know, this is obviously Democrat majority, um, shut it down. And uh, largely all of them cited, well, you know, nuclear waste is this big issue. We don't have a solution to it. Um, And I just think that's, it's honestly comical. Like this industry, the nuclear industry manages its waste better than any other industry does. It actually takes care of every little piece of it. Um, And, you know, people cite things like the the size of the waste is tiny, like the the amount of waste that we've used in all the decades we've run plants uh, can fit into a football field, right? Like it it tacked, I think stacked like 10 meters high. And so it's it's really small. Um, we know how to store it. There have never been any injuries or deaths from it. You put them in these uh, concrete casks. They sit next to the power plant. And um, there's really been no issues. The other thing is we know that we can bury them deep in the ground. Finland just built out a big geolog- geological deposit. And uh, we've just basically, you know, haven't been able to execute against doing that in Nevada at Yucca Mountain. It's just completely caught up in bureaucratic red tape and infighting. And um, so, it, it, you know, it's just one of these complete non-issues that people are using as an excuse. And that's just that's just one of a few kind of, um, you know, myths out there around nuclear. I mean, the other one that we should get into, and you're you're better at breaking these down than I am, but are the disasters. Like, that's another thing kind of coming in as somebody who is interested in it, thinking like, all right, well, again, there's it, it's awesome in a lot of ways, but then like it can kind of blow up like a nuclear bomb. And it did at Chernobyl and Fukushima and Three Mile Island and Pennsylvania, where I'm from. And those are like absolute nothing burgers. Julia, do you want to like go through the the stats on on those three? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, you had Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania in 1979. And um, I mean, the amount of radiation was released was tiny. It's like the size that you'd get like at an x-ray. And so there was just a huge overreaction to that one. And then... um, 
Chernobyl, I mean, true disaster here, but everything about that whole situation is just something that would never happen in the US, right? So you had shoddy Soviet technology, you had no containment dome. I mean, that is like safety 101. Um, the team there was running an uncontrolled experiment that they should have been doing. They were in the Soviet Union where they don't even, you know, they were just trying to cover the whole thing up. They weren't even sending the right kind of um, team in to take care of the accident. So you just had like everything go wrong that could possibly go wrong. Um, and given the way that we run things and the regulation we have in the U.S., just kind of like a non-starter that that would happen. Fukushima, I think, is, is fascinating. This is 2011. There is a tsunami that hits Japan. It kills almost 18,000 people. I mean, massive, massive tragedy, right? How many people die from the actual uh, nuclear disaster? Zero. I mean, maybe it's debated that there's one person that does, um, but essentially zero. And, um, you know, people like never even heard. I don't even know the name. Actually, I don't even know the name of the tsunami itself. I just know the name of the nuclear power plant. Right. That's embarrassing. <laughs> um, but 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 here's what's crazy. You had three reactors there. They had full meltdowns. This is a full nuclear meltdown and basically nothing happened. And that's just like, like, just turn that on its head. It's like, we could actually have full scale nuclear meltdowns and, and there's, and there's no, there's like no, it's no big deal. And I don't think anyone is ready to just like confront that as a reality. Yeah. Brett Kugelmas is one of the founders that we had on. I've heard him on other podcasts talking about the fact that he thinks we just need like more meltdowns. Like one, because it means that we're taking probably the right safety balance, but two, so people stop being so scared of meltdowns. It's just like this awful Simpsons colored word that just isn't as bad as as people think that it is. Did you did anybody else watch the UFO documentary that Steven Spielberg did on on Netflix? I haven't seen it yet. I didn't realize there's this whole history and I'm going to sound like a crazy person here and I don't want it to <laughs> take away from uh, the very well informed uh, you know takes that we have on on nuclear. But there's like apparently this history between UFO sightings and nuclear disasters. So Chernobyl, there were sightings, there've been sightings where the UFOs, and this is Spielberg and his team saying it, not me, uh, shut down like nuclear weapons, like the whole system, like they just weren't able to do anything with them because the, the, I guess the aliens don't want us to kill each other. And then Fukushima, they have video and it looks like a bunch of floating plastic bags, but these floating plastic bags that show up above Fukushima right after the disaster happened. I think that the theory that the people that they interview on the show have is that, you know, the aliens want us to have nuclear technology, but they want to make sure that we don't kill each other with it and that we're doing it in the best way possible. So it was an interesting connection that I, uh, that I, I hadn't seen, but one of them, I think said that the reason that there weren't more deaths at, at Fukushima was because like the aliens did something to, to make it less radioactive. I think it's more just the physical property of the, the nuclear waste. Okay. L l let's zoom back in. Talk more about why, nuclear has, has has stalled over the past few days or what why sort of the the climate movement hasn't picked up uh, on, on nuclear or was so in, in uh, uh, on the contrary maybe anti nuclear when you talk about some of the biggest reasons or, or say more about why this happened oh man there's a lot here I, I would say that um nadia wrote that great climate tribes piece and i would say that there are maybe one or two of those tribes that actually now are picking up on nuclear they're like this needs to be part of the solution um, I don't think many of them would want to say like, oh, we should have it be all of the solution, um, but should be part of it. So I, I actually think things are changing for nuclear pretty dramatically. And you'll see the polling even about public support for nuclear in the U.S. went from like low 40 percent about five years ago to 57 percent this past year uh, in favor of building more nuclear. So things are changing pretty quickly. Um, but I think, you know, historically, it was just it was so part of the environmental left to be anti-nuclear. I mean, it was that was the position of celebrities, right? You had at the major concerts, there were all the anti-nuke protests and signs. Like it was just part of mainstream culture that way. And uh, the, and to this day, actually- Why do you think actually, that is? Do you think it's just misinformed or do you think there's something deeper that it just well, kind of, yeah. There were a couple of things that happened. One is that- um, there were, there were, you know, we were in a cold war for a while and there was, there were atomic weapons testing sites where they were, you know, doing weapons to bomb, atomic bomb testing. Um, and there was some environmental impact from that. And so there was a whole, um, and then there was just like protest against war in general and weapons in general. And that was also, again, a very left leaning movement um, that then it got kind of merged in with the environmental movement that is small is beautiful. Um, you know, you, the, the head of the Sierra Club and, and, and these other nonprofits decided that 
um, it was that there was too much energy. This was too industrial that this was. And then they decided to use radioactivity as the boogeyman here, like the, the scary part of nuclear. Um, and so it just became this um, kind of merged thing to be anti-nuclear was the cool thing to be. And um, it coincided with a lot of economic factors that made it harder to just be building more nuclear in general. Um, but the cultural tide, I think, stayed for a long time and the industry just kind of went dormant. There was no one really championing it. It's not like the way the solar industry now where there's just like a lot of people who are super pro the industry that just didn't exist. Um, and it's only, I think, just starting, just starting to change. And, you know, the interesting thing is that Germany for a really long time is incredibly, incredibly anti-nuclear, right? Like you had like single digit percentage of people who are supportive, but that percentage is growing so fast because people are waking up a bit to the fact that if you're shutting down your nuclear and the cost of electricity is going way up and you're having to turn your coal plants back on again, which is obviously not good for your carbon emissions, which you supposedly care about, um, this is this weird cycle. So people are, people are finally, I think, um, becoming aware of the fact that like this is going to have to be part of a mix for whether whether you like it for energy security reasons, cost of electricity reasons, climate change reasons. There's like a lot of reasons to like it. Yeah, I think even if you go back to the beginning too, like some of that, and I can be the conspiracy theory guy talking about aliens and conspiracies, but I think this is, I mean, we've heard this over and over from people. One, you know, there there is kind of oil industry funding for kind of the beginnings of the anti-nuclear stuff. So we had that, that, that guest Rod Adams uh, has written about this and, and talked to us about it, and we include it in, in episode two. But uh, it talks about the fact that the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, you know, funded a study that essentially found that any dose of radiation, like even the tiniest possible dose of radiation was bad. And that ended up... It, there's an anti-New York Times here for the listeners who, who are on the anti-New York Times train. Um, but one of the Salzburgers was on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation when this happened, and they put the story on the front page of the New York Times. And this led to linear no threshold and, and then ultimately as low as reasonably allowable. It's one of the things that, you know, essentially the, the way that nuclear is regulated now is like that any amount of radiation less than you'd get in background radiation is a bad thing that has to be engineered and built against. And, and part of that, not all of it, but part of that came from this, this study uh, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, which has since been debunked. The One of the debunking papers that we read actually said that in that atomic testing, a little bit of the radiation, people actually had lower cancer rates if they were exposed to the radiation in the atomic testing because it it primed your body uh, to, I guess, be able to deal with, with the radiation. I'm not a, a medical doctor there. So that's, that's one of the pieces. Um, and then there is just like the anti-population, anti-growth thing that was happening at the same time. There's this great quote from Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb, where he said that giving humanity cheap, abundant energy is like giving an idiot child a machine gun. And so it's just like very directly tied to like, we don't think that people should grow because we don't think that the planet can, uh, that the planet can sustain the growth of people. And that has just been proven wrong over and over and over again. And, and this is going to be another one of those cases where, where it's proven wrong. Well, it, proven wrong, but I mean, they're the ones in control, right? Like the death cult of climate change is, is rooted in th there are too many people. Like when you actually like push the kind of most progressive people, I don't think it's responsible to have children. Uh, I, you know, like th they don't even start from like, how can we convert the, the energy supplies that we have to carbon free, right? And and I think the, the most prominent example of this is the, the person doing the most work on just like an actual, like look at what uh, he's done to, to push us towards a clean energy future is Elon Musk, right? And ooh, like to have the demon of the right in, in terms of these progressive people to think that, that someone, a capitalist could actually be effectuating this change for practical and, and profitable reasons is just you know an anathema so so it brings out the true colors is that like the the, the core constituency of this group of people and, and we've talked about this before it's 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 very christian it's it's very the the end of the world is going to come as a result of climate change and the righteous will be taken care of and the sinners will will be hurt and so it it actually has a lot less to do with like actually figuring out a practical way to to get to a clean energy future, let alone an increased energy future. It's about reshifting the entire economy and remaking the image. I mean, that's what the new, Green New Deal, like you just go read the text of it, has nothing to do with actually improving the environment, has everything to do with 
let 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 the government basically take over the economy and restructure it in a way that um, requires even more oversight from you know Washington D.C. rather than the free market. I don't know. I I, I think like Paul Ehrlich is so discredited at this point, as well as peak oil, as any any of these kind of um, Malthusianism generally. Yeah, yeah, all, all of it. it. It's just like they've had so many L's, yet the people who are in charge the the universities the media they they are it's like they're reading from the the kind of crib sheet from from these people yet they've been so discredited years later and we use the word nuke pill as like you know convert you to being a believer in nuclear energy but then there's also just nuke pill and like the more extreme version of a black pill and studying nuclear kind of has been that for me on a lot of a lot of these topics i'm generally like kind of optimistic and like oh, everyone's trying their best and and all that and then you see what what happens in nuclear and i, I think you're absolutely right that it's just this thing where like, if you believe that the world is going to burn and it's going to happen if we don't get our act together by 2050 and then you're also not not only not putting everything that you have into nuclear but actively campaigning against nuclear like there's clearly something else going on if you had this amazing solution to nuclear that if you ripped out all the regulation and just said like go build as much of this as humanly possible and the government will pay for it you could make a, a huge contribution to decarbonizing the grid pretty quickly if you stop caring about economics because it's this huge existential risk. And we're not doing that. And so it makes you wonder, you know, how much I, I, I am not, I, I believe that we need to, uh, get, you know, we need to solve the, the climate crisis and, and that the world is getting hotter. And like, I fully believe all of that. And I think there's a lot of not serious people who are standing in the way of really practical solutions to getting that done. Yeah, it's mood affiliation. It is. And I think I think the jury's still out on on where nuclear ultimately will land, because Congress right now, super bipartisan in support of nuclear energy, including many Democrats. And, uh, you know, I, I don't I, I don't know. We're going to have to see what happens. Nuclear is also something that's well positioned to be government supported and centralized. And there's a lot of people who who like, you know, like that style of government. Um, there are, you know, for the first time ever in the IRA, the Inflation Redu Reduction Act, there are subsidies now for uh, production tax credits for nuclear power plants. And, you know, obviously the, the weight has been on the um, tipping the scales towards solar and wind, given their subsidies on the grid. Uh, now you have a lot more support for nuclear for the first time. So I think we're starting to see this is what makes it interesting, right? It's like this is not just like been written off, you know, entirely here as something that, you know, the left is never going to support or, you know, it's never going to be economical. Um, I think what's going to be interesting is what's going to happen with the, you know, 10, 20 years in the future in terms of the actual grid itself, because we know it's um, the more renewables we put on it, if we don't have the right amount of storage in particular, the more destabilized it's going to be. And if no one's actually responsible for reliability of the grid uh, and, and we're subsidizing, putting something that is, you know, solar is the cheapest thing to go build and put on the grid, right? No question. Um, what's going to happen ultimately? Like it, it, I, you know, for someone who's a total free market capitalist, like it actually makes me want the government to take over and say like, no, we, we actually think that, you know, elect reliable electricity is a public good. And, you know, maybe this is something we need to take more control of. Um, these deregulated electricity markets, like where you had the Enron scandals, like people just trading on this stuff, like maybe that actually isn't uh, the best thing. Packy and I were just joking. We've gotten some interesting feedback um, since the podcast came out a couple of days ago. Um, one of them being, uh, you know, can you talk more about the grid? Because it's like, how does this even work? Like, how does how does nuclear like how do people think about like selling their solar power if they build a solar farm or like building a power plant? And it is honestly so opaque. I couldn't even give you a really good answer. Um, but there's, you know, I think a lot of interesting a lot of a lot of interesting places to go here in terms of like, should we have a more centralized um, government run uh, electricity source and, and grid? Yeah, I've, I've been roller coaster and I, I keep using that word with, with Julia roller coastering on this. I'm like, man, I am a, like a, a brazen free market capitalist, but like maybe sometimes like actually the government. And I think I think like the real challenge for nuclear right now, if like everybody, you know, we're 57 percent agreement. If at least there's not ideological stuff standing in the way, I think that the really, really big challenge right now is that. On the one side, you have solar and wind, which are being encouraged and, and NEPA can get in the way and their environmental reviews and it slows it down. And, and like that should probably go also. But like for the most part, things are lined up well for solar and wind. And then with nuclear, you have the situation where you have kind of like 
the worst possible form of of regulation mixed with you know the, the the argument that there should be like kind of currently you know utilities are on their own there's no government insurance there's not like a central government authority so you have like the free market on one side competing against the worst of our regulation on the other side and i think if you flipped that and if you to to julia's point if you if you incentivize whether that's with credits or taxes on the other side for things that aren't reliable i think if you incentivize reliability as a thing that we actually cared about I think just that would go would go a long way and you could potentially solve this in a free market way. I, I think the centralization thing sounds appealing, but like what what is a well run centralized thing in the United States? Like what what's the most effective centralized government run program? I like the DOE. Highways? Highways? <laughs> Are those state Are we, run? Like, I don't know. They, they built them in the fifties. What when, when have we built a, a new highway? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. Right. So, so, you know, maybe the comments, I mean, we are bad at sometimes, but maybe the comments will, will cite something that's a well run, or we could get our friend Noah to do a follow up podcast on this. But (laughs) my sense is that there is nothing that is well run by the federal government. We used to think that the military was well run. And I think in, in many pockets it is, but I I think like, you know, countless number of things that we've seen and and obviously the pull off from Afghanistan, what a disaster. So I, I, I think, to me, it's it's like it sounds nice, but there's no version that the the federal government is going to be able to well run. I mean, they can't even do a healthcare website. So I, I think like to think that they can manage like in a you know national electricity program. That said, like you can do incentives, and and I think as much as I don't like the Chips Act and the IRA because I think it's full of pork and graft, um, I, I I do think those incentives will yield some amount of uh, stuff in the free market. Um, But like, I don't know. I, I, I just look at Tesla. Like what, what did Tesla get from the government there? There's been a subsidy for uh, electric cars in the past. They've just added a new one. Uh, They had the DOE loan, which they paid back, but you know, other car companies did not. Um, I I guess they have a solar division. So there's a solar program, but uh, other than that, it's just like, build a product that works. And I think in, in terms of um, electricity, for the most part, people are, are fine with it. And I actually think if anything, it's um, it should just, there should just be more free market with it. So electricity should go up in cost, like I think in terms of the perversion that happens as a result of these super regulated utilities, it, just like water, uh, when things are cheap, people will use more of it versus if you actually let it float at the market rate, people will be more incentivized to say, hey, maybe instead of, I don't know, spending money on whatever silly thing, I'm going to get an insulation redone in my house or, or I'm going to think about like a, a heat pump. Or, so so I, I think letting consumers actually have to bear the full brunt of the cost of things will actually be the single best imperative for the market to solve it. But but that separate from nuclear in the sense that my, my understanding, and, and you guys should jump in here, is the primary reason we do not have more nuclear in this country is we have a, a federal regulatory agency that has no accountability, is not measured on how much net energy it creates. It's whole incentive for whatever several thousand people. What, what's the budget of the NRC? Is it like a couple billion dollars or something? I don't know the budget. It's a good question. Okay, so so you now have this like permanent bureaucracy of people who are working to go get their pension because they're federal employees. Like they have no incentive to do anything. It's just like, who, who is managing that, that uh, body? And my understanding of the NRC is it's one of these weird agencies like the Fed that is actually technically independent, um, even though if like you have any reading of the Constitution, not a lawyer, but my understanding is like there is no such thing as an independent thing in the Constitution, like Article 1, 2, 3, like th- there was nothing ever defined as, oh, this is a federal agency that is not subject to one of the three branches. Um, and so that that to me feels like the the, the primary focus problem to solve. But then if I step back, it's like, who's the constituency? Like, who actually really cares about driving this forward outside of startups or, or a couple of energy companies that, as, as you've pointed out, Julia, they make more money from decommissioning? Yeah, I mean, I would say you, this needs to be something that feels like it's the national interest to have more carbon-free, reliable, and eventually inexpensive. I mean, th- 
you know, we, we've talked about uranium on the, on the podcast somewhere. We talk about how it's 2 million times as dense as any sort of fossil fuel. Like this should be really good. Like, we have a founder who talks about the cost physics of why nuclear should be one of the cheapest forms of energy, but it's not because of all the regulations. So we, this is in our national interest to do this. What I think is hard is there isn't a constituency in the same way. I mean, there's, yes, there's a handful of utilities basically that own nuclear power plants. There's a couple, um, you know, there's a couple basically reactor manufacturers, Westinghouse, for example, but this is a, this is kind of a small group of people um, to get together and I think lobby effectively for change in the NRC. And I think that's why we haven't seen it. Meanwhile, they're up against countless nonprofits, environmental nonprofits in particular, with massive budgets uh, that just, you know, can lobby against, can sue, can, you know, do whatever it takes um, to to keep the status quo. I mean, they like that nuclear is entirely overregulated, right? So I think this is a really um, big challenge. Packy and I were, were noting that there weren't as many people complaining about the NRC and regulation as you might think, because I do think it's, it is a massive issue. And we were, we were wondering, like, have we all been kind of gaslit to believe like, well, we'll just figure out a work around it. It's all good. <laughs> Instead of being like, no, 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 this is the heart of the problem. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the, I think Congress is the one that needs to come together to say we need change. And they have started. There have been a couple of bills. Um, there's one that actually required the NRC to put together a framework around advanced reactors. So, as we move away from people are trying to do non-pressurized water reactors, um, but they didn't they didn't mandate its completion until 2027. So there's people like Oaklo and all these other startups that have been, been around for years um, that don't have a framework to build against, which is a huge problem. And then as, as we know, um, you know, there's just been this ratchet over time around the quality assurance requirements where it, you know, it ends up, you know, making the cost of concrete, like somewhere between 10 and a hundred X more expensive than it would be for just a normal construction project. So yeah, there's a lot wrong. I mean, the LNT framework we, we mentioned before um, that requires that, you know, you have to do anything you possibly could to minimize risk of radiation, which just means basically unlimited budget for this. Uh, And I think it's gotta be Congress and just the right group of people coming together to, um, to force some change here. And on, on the budget point, and I, I don't know what the overall budget number is, but I thought one of the more interesting things was that the companies that are uh, putting in their application for a license are paying the NRC by the hour to approve their licenses. So what was what a new scale pay? It, it was like on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars to have their application reviewed by the NRC, that is like the most misaligned possible incentive that you're making more money the more time you're spending uh, on reviewing applications. So that alone, I think, is is a huge mess. But to, to Julia's point, I mean, there's just now, I think, a bunch of entrepreneurs who are like, it would be awesome if regulation changed. We don't think so. And so we're going to go, you know, we're going to sell to the DOD or we're going to do radioisotopes on the moon or we're going to the UK or like, all of the startups that we talked to are like, all right, what are the, what's the, the regulatory workaround that, that that we can have here? Most of them are still subject to the NRC, at least in in development. And I think there is this big missing piece on like every time something is slower, there's just less iteration and improvement. And like the you know, you're working on like decades long or more kind of iterations versus you know software where you can do that in a second. There's no experimenting in your backyard or your basement, and so just like it slows down innovation in this way that is invisible, but I think really, really harmful in terms of developing even better forms of uh, nuclear reactors in, in the future. So it's it's just like, I, I think it's, I think people are sick of complaining about it if you're in the industry, but as someone coming from outside the industry, like it absolutely seems uh, like like a, an effort to, to work on. And I would say like, I know there's a lot of competing, uh, a competing interest for this kind of group's energy, but if there was like a, an EAC or techno optimist lobbying group and it had to go after one thing, I mean, open source AI is kind of the one to defend du jour maybe, but I think like nuclear is just such a good representation of all of the things that, that we're kind of fighting for and an enabler of everything. Like I would say that the, the techno optimist pack should go after, after nuclear. Yeah. I, I think that the one thing I would, push and and obviously Julia you guys are focused on the the Department of Defense with your company which it doesn't fall under the NRC regulation um I, I guess my like bias towards any federal regulator is that they are never going to change their policy um unless there comes top down which usually means you have an administration 
that actually deeply cares about this and is willing to put major political chips, despite these people supposedly working for the president, you're going to have to actually use up whatever budget you have. And, and I, I just find it very hard to imagine a president coming in and having this even be a, a top five issue. And so I think it, it, it like to think of like, how do you get this upstream, like to get to that place where then you actually have a president willing to kind of just like blow up basically, maybe not the right term when you're talking about nuclear, but <laughs> reorganize the NRC to make it something that is actually driven towards like, how do we increase the use of nuclear energy in a safe way in the United States? I think you have to change public opinion. And I think the podcast that you guys are doing, uh, the Oliver Stone documentary, for those who haven't seen that, Nuclear Now, terrific. Um, but even there, it's like, okay, who, 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 who wants to wake up and just like, this is my issue? Um, I would imagine that like one other way from a cultural standpoint to kind of like make this more palatable is if you get celebrities um, to actually virtue signal about this, right? Because then it that starts to become more a little bit more diffuse, right? Like Kim Kardashian with her her kind of new controversial bra is like there and talking about nuclear with those <laughs> nerd glasses. Like that's going to have a bigger impact um, than you know a bunch of kind of like startups being like, hey, we should we should change this because fundamentally you need to get you know again either administration or or Congress to change the law. And in the case of Congress. Most of these people don't want a nuke in their backyard. Um, so you have to bribe them essentially with some amount of ad additional money. Uh, so they're, they're going to not be incentivized to do it. And then even if you're on the energy committee or, or the kind of one that would be able to push forward some regulatory overhaul, uh, you're going to have all the other congressional people being like, wait, I don't want a nuke in my backyard. So changing the perception and safety around, hey, like having a, a nuke is actually good for my community. Um that I think is that's the fundamental issue, right? Like the fact that Indian, what is it, Indian Point in New York was the yeah. quarter of New York City's electricity, all carbon free. And they shut it down shut and it they down. put up natural right. gas. Progressive <laughs> New York, New York that's enlightened, you know, oh, climate change. We don't want fracking. Let's just cut 25% of our carbon, you know, like it, it just insanity, right? The same thing with their, their immigrant policy. So it's like they virtue signal one way and then they actually do something completely different. I, I think you have to change it at that level. And it doesn't matter what the people on the right think. It's like, you got to get the people on the left to think that this is actually a sexy issue, right? It needs to be cool for people in Hollywood. I also, I do like that there are all of these startups now figuring out how to build as quickly as they possibly can. Because there's also this other challenge where if you can get that support, you then need to put it on a, a, a presidential candidate or congressional member, senator, who's like, all right, cool. I'm going to put all of my chips on the table for this thing that currently will take 10 to 15 years to come online. And so like, I do think that there needs to be that work from the, the either, you know, entrepreneurial community or from, uh, you know, the people who are putting large reactors online to say like, look, when you're ready, we can actually get this up and running in five years or six years or something where you might actually reap the political rewards for, for bringing this thing online. So I do think like you probably need a little bit from both sides of when, when that movement happens, we're able to get up and running. Uh, pretty quickly. So we, we've been talking about the need for more uh, evangelism. Let's talk more about uh, the need for, for more building and, and what are the opportunities for, for people listening in who, who actually want to to do something here. Uh, and maybe we start, Julia, by by you giving a, a brief introduction. Dan hinted it, you know, that you're building in the space. Why don't you talk about whatever you're willing to share about, about, about what you're building and how you navigated the idea maze of kind of where are the opportunities to even build? Totally. So uh, yeah, I, I guess a little pre-announcement here, because uh, we haven't officially announced the company yet, but I'm working on a company called Antares, and we are building a micro reactor. It's about a 300 kilowatt size, so very, very small mini micro reactor. Um, this would be about the size of a large diesel generator in power output. And um, we are intending to go sell to the military as our first customer. Um, benefits of that are, again, not having to go through the NRC, which is the regulator of the civilian grid. And the Department of Defense is interested in resiliency in their austere locations. So think the Pacific region and all the islands there, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Um, so being able to have a power source that can last for five years without needing any refueling. And again, fuel is voluminous when you're talking about fossil fuels. And um, it's also very vulnerable. And actually 50% of the deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan 
were from refueling missions because you have these, you know, massive tanks coming through, very obvious target. They kind of need to come in roughly the same plate, you know, way every time. Um, they're not secured the way that the bases are. And so, you know, very vulnerable. If you don't have it, you're really screwed. Uh, so they're very interested in a resilient form of energy like this. And, um, you know, bonus points, basically, that it's carbon free. I would not say that is the top concern of the military, but it's climate change is definitely on their radar. Uh, the Arctic region is actually more contested than I realized, too. And so, um, again, a place where you're hauling diesel for you know, miles and miles and miles of very austere terrain um, and you know, being able to put a reactor in there is uh, there's a lot to like about that. And then there's actually a lot going on in space right now. I think there will be, you know, escalating conflict in terms of space capabilities between us and our adversaries and uh, being able to have nuclear power and nuclear propulsion is a huge benefit in space. And we haven't been doing much of it really since the 1960s. And so there's some um, interesting new government funding programs out there for doing more nuclear in space. So that's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm doing, working on in terms of building in the space. Um, but one thing I might even just say backing up about the kind of building landscape in general is that uh, I'm concerned about the fact that we just finished building the Vogel power plant in Georgia, which are these, you know, gigawatt scale, you know, this, this is a power, this is like grid scale power for millions of homes. Um, and they were incredibly over budget, over timeline. And we now have no more of those scheduled to be built in the US. Nobody is going to do that. Um, and in China, they're building, you know, it's like 23 power plants. In Russia, they're building many more. India is actually building several right now. Um, and again, these are all places where there's a centralized body that is doing the building. And I'm sure they're not, you know, there's not even the, the close to the same amount of regula regulation, right? Like safety theater, <laughs> basically, around the building. Um, and so that that is what worries me. But I think, Dan, going back to your point about like, what does the US do well? It doesn't really tend to do centralized federal things particularly well. Um, and then this is where this concept of SMRs has come up. It's like, hey, should we just scale down the size of reactors a lot more, build something that can be manufactured instead of you know this giant bespoke construction site? Um, and let's just try to do that because at least we know that in the U.S., we've seen zero economy, uh, zero productivity improvement around construction, but we actually have seen improvement on um, production lines and manufacturing. And so let's let's at least attempt this approach. And so basically, what you'll see out there is uh, all the, the, I mean, all of the nuclear startups are doing some smaller scale version of building in hopes that they can take advantage of the fact that uh, America actually does do advanced manufacturing very well. It's something we've gotten better at, and. We, you know, we can't seem to figure out the gigascale projects. So let's let's take this other path. Um, anyway, so that that is maybe the kind of the, the general background too. Well, the other like analogy, and again, bring up Elon because he's usually involved in this kind of stuff. Is look at look at what American space has had happen over the last twenty years, right? So twenty years ago, it was only the government in in kind of business. You had the beginning of SpaceX, Blue Origin, a few of these other kind of com companies. Um, within a decade. You, you actually did have SpaceX and, and, and funded by the government in terms of a NASA contract, right? So treated like another defense contractor, but it was a fundamentally different type in the sense that it was not kind of designed to just take advantage of this cost plus, uh, just suck money from the government as much as you can. It is a mission-driven company and th the money coming from the government was critical to, to funding and, and kind of moving the, the progress forward for SpaceX. But then they've also, I think, pushed, uh, and I don't know if they pioneered it or, or they're kind of one of the first ones to popularize it, but this milestone-based approach to government funding, um, which has just embarrassed the traditional the defense contractors, right? So the SLS system, uh, or I guess SLS because system is the last S in that, but uh, the SLS has yet to have a successful uh, launch to the International Space Station, I'm pretty sure. Whereas SpaceX is just, they're, they're shooting like a rocket up every four or five days. Um, and, and so I think, and, and to think that we, we didn't have even capability of sending uh, astronauts to the space station for a while after the, you know, the shutdown of the space shuttle. Whereas now I think SpaceX represents 80% of all payload into orbit, like globally, like it, it just in terms of you take everybody else's stuff going up into space, it's, it's one company. And so I think getting a, a world where nuclear could have that same type of thing where you, through SMRs and, and kind of opening a, a new opportunity, 
that doesn't have this kind of Byzantine regulatory apparatus that has zero incentive to approve new things, we, we could actually kick off a, you know, a big cycle of, of energy abundance and, and in a way that, you know, fracking has done on the fossil fuel side of things. And, you know, my favorite thing is what has been the single biggest contributor to decrease in U.S. emissions? Fracking, because we've replaced coal with natural gas. And so you, you ask your average environmental person, they wouldn't be able to tell you that. I can promise you that they would, they would come up with some BS around solar and wind, which, by the way, solar cost curve coming down for sure. And, and that's going to be a critical component to the long term energy future. But if you want to say the single highest you know, impact thing that we've done over the last decade is shifting coal, uh, you know, natural gas. And of course, the progressive states are the ones that ban the fracking. Right. But they're happy to take the credit for for the, the decrease in emissions. Yeah, and, and your point about SpaceX, I, there was an article I think that came out last week that Boeing's defense space and security division tried to do some of like the the non cost plus contracts, the more traditional or the more SpaceX contracts and lost one point seven billion dollars during the first three quarters of the year. And so now they have to go out and tell their shareholders like, look, we are never not doing a cost plus contract again. It's cost plus contracts only from here on out. And hopefully, you know, SpaceX and then Vanderbilt and whoever else is coming in and saying we're not doing cost cost plus contracts and we're going to win on cost and we're going to win, you know, the way that, that people normally win in the free markets. Like, hopefully, those keep happening. And would love to see the same kind of thing happen in in nuclear. I would love the, if we could take the Vogel team and go get them to work somewhere else. I think you can get efficiencies if you do that five or ten times. But then I really think like. You know, we talked to a company that's doing taking over shipyards that are they're at least now negotiating taking over shipyards in South Korea because a lot of these these founders are now saying like this is just like a big complex machine and we are about a hundred times more expensive than any other big complex machine by volume in the nuclear industry so like we can get cheaper than they're doing it in China we can come you know further and further and further and like kind of get on that that uh learning curve that solar is on, which I agree is like one of the modern miracles that solar has been able to get so cheap. But like, can we start just printing these things out in shipyards and getting better and better and better and better at doing them to the point where like, you don't need to worry about government subsidies and you can just kind of make, uh, you know, make nuclear capacity in a modern way. I think one thing, um, and it's turning into a love letter to Elon, but whatever, I, I think he's an incredibly <laughs> inspiring person. Um, one, one thing that's just so clear about the biography is the, in, in both Tesla and SpaceX, the concept of a founder led manufacturing company in the United States that is that is going for growth, right? Not at like a kind of specialized, like more traditional, like, oh, I have this you know factory in Ohio and like we provide this part that goes into the overall machine where it truly vertically like like Henry Ford, right? Like a, a vertically integrated like we are going to take raw materials into one part of the factory on the other side, a car comes out and to have someone who has total authority in terms of being able to make decisions, walking the line and being able to dig down to the smallest detail of saying like, well, why are we doing it like this? Like, let, let's change it like this. Or, and, and I think that the two other like things that are just seared into my head now, and I actually just saw this, I, I mentioned this with the Twitter release, right? It's like everyone says Twitter going down the tubes. They just did this year long uh, review post of all the stuff they've done from an engineering standpoint. And you can't unsee the two things Elon does. Who said that this was a requirement? I want an actual name. And I want that person to come into the room and tell me why this is a requirement. And if you can't find that person, it's no longer a requirement. And then the second thing is uh, delete. And it's just like, no, sorry, like, let's just remove this. And his, his point is that if you delete enough, you're going to end up adding about 10% back because that didn't work. And I think his point of view, and this has happened both at Tesla and SpaceX, is you've been able to just drive the the efficiency and economies of scale in terms of the actual production. Um, and, and even more at SpaceX, where they have this idiot index. I mean, I, I, I should be letting Julia talk about this because she worked at SpaceX. But the idea that any part that touches uh, aerospace or, or defense, and I'm assuming this probably happens with nuclear, it, it, you know, the concrete example notwithstanding, is, is 10 to 100x more expensive because it somehow meets that grade when the reality um, is you probably can achieve the same technical requirements as well as um, kind of whatever whatever baseline safety requirements you need to have. Uh, and, and 
I think the proof is in the pudding in the sense that Tesla has an extremely good safety record in terms of their cars. Now, put FSD to the side and, and the arguments around that. And then obviously, SpaceX, right? They consistently land their rockets like they're not blowing up. And so that approach, that just like maniacal approach to driving to the cheapest possible solution that solves the, the job, that just doesn't exist in American like uh, manufacturing, especially if you think about anything that the government is paying for because of cost plus, right? There is no incentive to do that. The incentive is how can we get, add a little bit more plus to the, the cost? Well, there's no one handing out cost plus contracts right now for a nuclear startup. So everyone's going to have to be super scrappy, you know, already on the team, myself and uh, another SpaceX person are, you know, I think just like uh, adore Elon's frameworks, right? We'll definitely need to implement those. And I think, What's nice is there is government support right now for nuclear fuel because we don't, we actually basically completely lost the ability to work on enrichment. I'm not sure if I'm even supposed to mention this, but way back in the day, Dan actually <laughs> briefly worked with a, um, with a nuclear enrichment company based in Ohio that went, basically it went defunct and then just uh, in the last month has now been stood up by the U.S. government to start enriching uranium again so that we can have our own source of fuel. So there is going to be support for the industry, which, I mean, is needed. We need to have the fuel to do this. Um, but I don't think we're going to see any sort of cost plus bailout type contracts for the actual reactors themselves. Um, but that's just the name of the game. It's like it's going to have to be more free market than that. But, but here's the, the challenge. So if you want free market, you can't have a regulator that prevents the free market from happening. Like there should be a set of safety uh, guidelines, right? And like, I am no fan of the FDA. I think the FDA actively ends up killing people as a result of just putting the, the kind of set of uh, onerous regulations on drug development. Um, but the FDA still lets drugs come to market, right? The NRC does not let nukes get built. Like this is just a failed federal agency. Uh, it is a jobs program for for those, you know, whatever, several thousand people who work there. That's it. Like the, yeah. the we have to figure out a way to allow people to take risk. Right. Like imagine imagine. I don't know if you guys have ever read any of the books. Um, uh, what is it? Dealers of Lightning or Wizards of Lightning, like early electricity, uh, like Edison mm -hmm. and like how, how it was happening in New York. The number of fires, and of course, these fires were happening in like rich people's houses because they were the first ones to get like wired for electricity, right? It, like it would never be approved today. We would be, we would have like you know the the electricity regulatory, the ERC, and they would never <laughs> allow anyone to get any electricity because oh gosh, there was this one thing, and and like someone's horse got you know died in a fire, so let's shut that down. And like uh, early aviation, like none of this stuff d doesn't have a like has risk people will die like that is not the goal but it is a cost to make progress and in doing so we all become better off right like from a health standpoint from a wealth standpoint from a civilizational standpoint like we have to we have to have some amount of risk taking and instead we we have this kind of like hall monitor culture where everything needs to be approved by all these other people and everyone wants to absolve themselves of responsibility, right? Like what was the disaster that happened in what is it, Indiana or something with the, the train or was it in Ohio? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Classic example. Like, is this like no accountability? Did anyone get fired? No. Like, and, and so, so not only do we have this like hall monitor safety culture, there is no accountability within it. So it's just like, Oh, well we, we, you know, like we had the rules in place. Well, it's just like, well, Gosh, if you have all these these rules that are supposed to prevent this and it still happens, someone should probably get fired. Instead, someone's going to have their pension paid for by the federal government. Like it, it's, it's completely ridiculous. Yeah, the other thing that's tough here is there's a, a huge double standard between that and nuclear. Like imagine if this, the like you know some person is injured by nuclear waste. Imagine if that ever were to happen, right? I mean, you would just see the industry want to get entirely shut down. Meanwhile. No problem if people are dying at refineries with, you know, there was an explosion that killed two brothers that kind of made the news in the last year and um, super tragic, but like seems par for the course for, you know, oil and gas, right? People are just going to die because things blow up sometimes. Imagine if that happened in the nuclear industry. Like there's just absolutely no tolerance for anything. There cannot be a single mishap. I mean, it's, com it, it, you know, it's completely, um, it's like it, you, you just, you just uphill battle, battle the whole way. And 
Eli Dorado wrote this incredible piece on just kind of praising uh, a new kind of change at the at the FDA called or the FAA, sorry, uh, called Mosaic uh, and how they deal with a particular type of light aircraft. And one mm -hmm. category of airplane was actually like doing really well safety wise. And so they expanded it to let more different planes into that piece of the regulatory framework that was that was safer. And in it, he, he shares this uh, safety continuum chart that actually comes from the FAA itself, where they say, if you have too little rigor in terms of safety and, and risk, that's obviously an issue. There are fatal accidents that increase and blah, blah, blah. But if you have too much rigor, you also stop all of the innovation that actually makes things safer over time. So there's all of these advanced reactor designs right now that make it like physically impossible for a reaction to spread. And they're not allowed to be even really tested, let alone kind of put uh, put onto the grid. And that's like a very clear example of this safety continuum where you, you don't want to be too far. Like there are just absolutely no rules. Anybody can have fully enriched uranium and make nuclear reactors in their backyard. But if you go too far to the other side, one, there's all of these untold deaths when you don't grow and when you know you have to use coal instead and all of that. But then two, it's just like the, the nuclear that we do have is going to be less safe because you don't allow the safety innovation to take place, and so hopefully, uh, who I, I didn't expect that I'd be, you know, praising uh, the FAA, but you know, it'd be cool to see other kind of uh, you know regulatory agencies at least kind of recognize that there are these, uh, you know, that there is a, a challenge if you try to make things too safe and if you try to minimize risk too much. But I, I think one one thing to point out um, with both the FDA and the FAA, you have. Um, extremely well-funded and motivated parties on the other side who are very good at playing the game in terms of Congress, right? So like uh, aerospace is is sprinkling all of the jobs programs in all the different states. I, I think that my favorite is the, the F-35, the, the next-gen fighter. Every single U.S. state has a some some part of that supply chain. So that that every senator is incentivized to make sure that that plane Whatever, whatever uh, the F-35, I think it's a couple of companies that have come together there. Uh, whatever they want, that's going to get pushed in Congress. And I think what's challenging is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Julia, so you have Westinghouse, which makes the reactors. You have, you know, these bigger energy companies, uh, electricity utilities that maintain these plants that exist. But no one's doing just nukes, right? It's, like, it's part of a portfolio. And so for them, they're kind of like, hey, like we could go fight to add this thing, but it's actually pretty costly versus way easier for us to either go add another nat gas plant here or expand an existing facility. Or if the government's willing to subsidize solar, we'll take those dollars and, and go build out solar and wind. And so I think that that is the challenge is that there is no organized money. And as much as there's a lot of energy with startups and, and like that's what's going to actually get us to go, go forward from a, just a dollar standpoint, there's just not a lot of organization, right? And, and obviously with the FDA, you have you have pharmaceutical companies, which are very uh, revolving door with that organization. So I, I'd be curious, like how many NRC former staffers are going to work for nuclear startups? Like maybe maybe that's like the, the first step uh, yeah. to kind of beating, beating the board. You, you know, Packy and I addressed this actually in the next episode that's going to launch, which is there are no developers for nuclear power plants the way there was just this whole like, uh, you know, you know, influx of basically solar and wind farm developers who said, oh, I see this opportunity here. I can buy some solar panels, buy some land, get the permitting, get, um, you know, set them up, start selling power to the grid, get the subsidies I want and start making tons of money. And so you had all of these developers, a whole industry of solar people, of wind people who now could be an organized group to go lobby, to continue to have subsidies for um, the developments that they built out. And we don't really see that with nuclear today. And I think it's because the hurdle is so high to actually just build your first plant, right? Like Vogel, three, uh, sorry, $30 billion to build these two reactors, adding on to an existing nuclear power plant, let alone a, you know, a one from scratch. So I think that that is um, the biggest challenge here. The hope I have is that if you can go smaller, and Microsoft, for example, just announced that they uh, are seeking seeking SMRs, like they want to buy nuclear power, they want reliable carbon free power for their data centers. Uh, now, I think you're going to get some ears perking up from the developer types to say, okay, interesting, like, 
can I be the person who puts together, you know, I'm going to buy the reactor from this company, figure out the land thing, the permitting thing, the whatever, and sell it to Microsoft. And if you can get, um, if you can get that industry going, I think you do have a powerful contingent or a group that um, then therefore has interest in going in lobbying for the right things, whether it's, Hey, these SMRs, you know, they shouldn't have the same sort of regulation. Let's do, you know, let, let's have this um, new regulatory framework for these smaller ones. And, you know, I, I actually think that that's the way to go in terms of regulatory reform is don't try to dismantle the old stuff because people freak out and that's too hard to get rid. You just add, right? So it's like, oh, for, for, for small reactors, we can do it with this, this different regulatory framework. And, you know, these develop developers maybe come together and say, hey, uh, let's do it like this. And we're going to throw some serious lobbying dollars at this. And I actually think Congress right now is extremely receptive to pro-nuclear lobbying. Like people should be doing this. Uh, and, it, and it is the game that's played is like, how do you lobby for your subsidies or your whatever? Um, sadly, I think that's the way it goes. And um, now's the time. So I'd love to see, you know, with the advent of these uh, SMR companies, assuming again, everyone, we can all make it and not run out of money um, while we're trying to develop the product. Um, if you can have that land with the developers, I think you're in a good place. What do you say to, to, to I don't know if Smith's been on the show or is, is coming on a later episode. My, my sense is that someone like him, maybe a stand in for a you know, smart, progressive person um, would would say that we're either overestimating the sort of the the opportunity for nuclear or underestimating wind and solar and the, it, nuclear is just one of you know a few sort of technologies that will, will help us get get through and it's important to give them their proper due as well like where, where is the, the disagreement there so we have a whole episode on this because I, I think like to, to julia's earlier point on these like climate tribes and religions we are not arguing that nuclear should be the only thing on the grid. And like, this is the only thing that is ever going to work. I think solar is awesome. I, we've, we've had a harder time finding people who like are willing to go on a microphone and, and defend wind, but solar in particular, and particularly if you pair it with batteries, which is the big kind of Noah push that both of these things are getting so much cheaper and, and solar and batteries together essentially are, are stable and we can just keep producing these things. It's a really good combination. And like we, completely agree. We had Casey Hanmer on also, who, who's a founder of a company called Terraform Industries. They're using uh, solar to do direct air capture uh, and, and turn uh, turn carbon into hydrocarbons, essentially, to have this kind of like, uh, you know, net zero fuel that you can put in airplanes or put kind of anywhere else, who's also really, really bullish. He thinks that we can get to 99% of our grid uh, by 2020, 2050, or by 2050 coming from solar. And so we wanted to bring on really smart people who could give us that case and they make a really, really convincing case. I think the counter uh, when we ask people in nuclear and just kind of our own belief is that to have 10 or a hundred times kind of more energy, nuclear is going to be a necessary piece of that mix to have to Julia's point earlier, uh, you know, a more reliable grid in the short term before we figure out batteries, nuclear is a, a hugely important piece of that. Like nuclear, Fission, and we talk about fusion, we could come on maybe later in the second half of the season and do the fusion thing. Uh, but but both of those are just these incredibly energy dense, resource light sources of energy that should be the cheapest things if you just get kind of some of the regulation out of the way, if you get some of these learning curves happening. They're the way that you get to 10 times, 100 times more energy. And that seems like a utopian thing. AI data centers are consuming an absolute shitload of energy. If you want to put robots on the map, you're talking about instead of like work a workforce that uh, is being powered by food, you're talking about a workforce that is being powered by electricity from the grid. More and more and more and more things that we're going to want to do over the next couple of decades are going to require electricity. Then a lot, you know, I think we think that that the way to kind of meet a big part of that need is by adding nuclear to the mix, not replacing everything with it, but adding. Uh, adding nuclear to the mix, let alone like putting these things all around the world and giving all of the countries that that have much less energy usage than the U.S. and poverty as as you know a direct consequence of that, giving them a way to become energy independent and and kind of get up to a Western standard of living. I think being nuclear skeptical is actually a pretty reasonable stance to have. I think being anti-nuclear is kind of dumb. Like there's a lot to like about it, and there's you know all these safety things are overblown, et cetera. But being skeptical. Is not so crazy, right? We know Vogel was um, extremely expensive to build. We know that there are no plans to build this out. Um, it seems just unlikely that a utility is going to take on this existential risk to itself by undertaking a massive project like Vogel. 
um, when they could just build a natural gas plant or build a natural gas peaker plant that pairs well with some solar and wind because they are, um, you know, whenever the, the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, you just turn on your natural gas plant, way cheaper to do, way easier, like pretty green, like that's like no no big deal. Um, so I think it's, it's reason, that's actually reasonable to be skeptical, but I think nuclear has so much potential and with um, with with some of the changes we've potential changes we've talked about, if we can get SMRs to work, if we get developers to build out, if we can tweak the incentive structures um, or subsidies towards nuclear, like I think we can tip the scales where nuclear can be viable. And I think it's uh, you know it, it would be such a benefit to society to have that you know again, Packy and I are trying to change the narrative here, open up the conversation, inform, educate, get people excited about this. What I do think you have though, it just go it goes to show that everyone is you know, we're humans and we're so narrative driven and people get a little bit tribal, like people get kind of tribal about being solar people. And so then they just lean into all the advantages and the, the benefits and the potential for solar and the potential for batteries, even though, you know, we don't have, you know, anywhere close to the storage ability that we will need for a grid to be run on renewables, right? And so, you know, you there, there's just some of that, like, you know, you, you pick your thing and you kind of lean into it and you try to get other people excited about it. And uh, I think that we want to push both forward because, you know, who exactly knows what the battery curve is going to look like? We don't have them today, but maybe we will in 10 years. Like, great. Um, so let's be pushing everything forward because we, we know we ultimately want more energy. And if we get better batteries and we have more kind of power coming into those batteries, then we can do... We need more kind of like energy, uh, like I guess higher powered batteries, but those are being developed as well. Then we can get flying cars and then we can do all the other stuff that's that's battery powered. So I think electricity has this, or energy and electricity have this beautiful characteristic of like the more you make and the cheaper you make it, the more people will consume it. Uh, and so like, I just want all of these sources to come down the cost curve and, and uh, you know, put more put more terawatts on, on the grid because the more we have, the more cool stuff we can do, the faster we can get to, you know, not just a sci-fi future, but just like a, a future where things are cheaper and where inflation can come down. Like all these good things happen. Uh, and so more solar and geothermal and wind where it makes sense. And nuclear is like a great thing. We, we talked to Noah about this before and to kind of, I think, summarize his argument, two things. One, cost of nuclear is the only thing that's increased. So if you look at all other energy sources, uh, the, the cost to build out more kilowatt, kilowatt hours has decreased with solar being the most dramatic. Um, you could argue that it's the NRC. I think the second kind of thing to couple though is the way we build nuclear today or, or in the past are these massive plants, right? So they require massive amounts of money upfront, um, which at that point, the capital markets tap out. Like they just, they're not gonna go do something that they know could potentially then go balloon to then be in a super regulated environment where you can't actually make back that money. So I think if you if you think about it from a just like capital markets problem, um, you can either do two things. One, you can have the government back it all up, which that could be a, a national industrial policy that we say is like, hey, this is strategic for us. I think what's challenging in, in that regard is the U.S. is blessed with two things. We're actually, you know, three. We have a ton of fossil fuels, so we're energy independent there. Um, we actually have really good solar in terms of the regions where we, we do have a lot of sunshine. And if you just look, if you type like solar map of Europe, sunshine map of Europe, there's an irony here in that Germany is trying to move to solar and they have this like one of the worst in, in like mainland Europe, ignore, ignore the super north, like they just don't get a lot of sunlight. Um, and, you know, Fran France is also in, in the, you know, most of the country doesn't actually get a lot of solar. And then we also have a lot of wind too. So like in terms of like, we, we actually have a really good mix that we can use um, in those other sources. Whereas a country like France, which doesn't have a lot of fossil fuels um, and isn't gonna be as good for solar, nuclear like that is worth having a national industrial policy to say, hey, we are going to backstop the cost of this because we wanna be energy independent. We wanna be uh, less reliant on Russian energy or energy from the Middle East. And so I think we, we can do that at the government level. The My bias and, and what I think that the market is leaning towards is let's build smaller ones, right? Like, so so don't have it be $10 billion to go build a new plant. Let, let's use the latest and greatest and let entrepreneurs in a safe way take some risk, build build new new types of reactors that are smaller that the capital markets are going to be able to go do, right? Like the fact that, you know, uh, 
Julia's company is able to kind of go pursue venture capital means that like there there is free market interest in this space. It's just like we, we need to kind of unlock it so that the, the entrepreneurs in a, in a kind of reliable or a reasonably safe way can actually go and pursue the innovation. Right. Like that, I, I think that is where, where I would agree with Noah in the sense that like we shouldn't just go build more Vogels, like like $30 billion a pop. Like, I mean, it's probably better than what we spend a lot of our money on. Right. Like I'd rather have three more nuke plants than send any money to Ukraine. That's my personal opinion. But the like, I think the the challenge is that we have to change how we are doing it because kind of like that, that classic article about the second Avenue subway in New York, like the current model does not work. So it needs to kind of have a a shakeup up and down, right. Both, both on the government side and, and on the kind of market side. Just quickly that the capital markets piece is one of the things that we keep coming back to. And like one of the design requirements or, you know, when they're going through the idea maze, the thing that practically every founder that we've talked about, is cognizant of from day one more than you see in software is like all right what is what is the thing that i can build will kind of that will kind of fit into a capital markets sized hole and that the capital markets are willing to finance and when do i have to do what and oaklo just you know is, is going public kind of after 10 years which kind of makes it fit into that venture bucket and so like there's a bunch of things and thinking happening on the capital market side that uh at least entrepreneurs are being thoughtful about that hopefully makes that uh you know, a more viable path now than it has been in the past as well. Well said. We're we're gearing at, at time here. Is there anything that we haven't yet covered or, or, or mentioned that's that's worth uh, mentioning be- before we close? And 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 separately, uh, Packy, I, I want you to do a plug for the for the podcast uh, m- more broadly in terms of your your vision for for where it's going to go from here. Um, we're all we're all massive fans of uh, of not boring, uh, uh, you know, as hosts, but also our, our audience too. So, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that as well. Julia, anything we... I think we covered a lot. I mean, I'm excited. We have a bunch of upcoming episodes on the show too. So um, stay tuned. I think the big questions for me are, again, what can we be pushing, whether policy-wise or otherwise, to be building more nuclear? Like that is the discussion that just needs to continue to happen. Agreed. Um, And in terms of why we're doing Age of Miracles, um, I I reached out to you when I think it was a three-minute old idea. But really, like you know, every week I write about a different topic, and they're all around the same themes. They're all optimistic and pro progress, and increasingly kind of hard startup and and atoms based startup. And I, I love the kind of renaissance that's going on on that side of the world. But I do think if you want to explore these industries like nuclear, which is just this bear of an industry that I'm never going to get right, and I also don't want to only be my voice when I'm writing a piece about it. One, having a co-host like Julia, who's spent time in this space and is building a company in this space as an expert and can be a guide. I think partnering with somebody uh, to, to have a season on a topic that I think is really important is useful. And then the fact that we've talked to, I don't know, 40 people, at least 50 people uh, you know, in and around nuclear fission and now talking to people in fusion energy to really try to understand, like not just, you know, there's this great Eve Vanguard tweet that we talk about, which is that pro-nuclear is an obviously atrocious stance now, but the question is like, how do you get the cost of nuclear down so you can build it? We want to be able to go into all of those details to get to the point that, where we can say like, these are the three things that we think are the most important to make this thing happen. In future seasons, maybe we'll do advanced manufacturing or cell therapies or all these other things that I think are going to be important to, to kind of building this amazing future that I do think is possible, but is going to take a lot of hard work. And I think we're just starting on hard mode with nuclear, where it's the one where there's the most resistance to, like, it's the biggest gap between the potential of the technology and the support for it or you know, the risk, resistance against it. So starting there, but future seasons are all going to be about these really challenging things that are going to take a lot of work to get from kind of innovation to like this huge impact that I think they could have and want to explore with smart people what it's going to take to make that happen. Yeah, that, that's well said. One thing I just want to call out just in terms of uh, in, in inspiring people about your guys' stories is, is, is Packy, you know, in, in 2018 or 2019, or I don't know when you started to ramp up, but I feel like you, before you started Not Boring, you had what, like 2000 Twitter followers or something? Like you didn't have a, a, a massive I had, audience. I had- 300 Twitter followers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you didn't have massive I tweeted about like the started. Philadelphia Eagles and <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You had no like public writing experience. Like it was not obvious that you would, you know, become the, the best writer in, in tech, which is what, what I think you are, you are today. Um, and, and Julie, I feel like 
you know, in 2021, you, you know, you had like no nuclear uh, knowledge or, 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 or background or, or experience. And then within like a three month period or, or some small window, you just went down the, the rabbit hole, wrote this amazing piece and, you know, in a very short time established yourself as a, as a, as an expert in, in the space, at least, at least within, within tech. And so I think you're both your stories are both testaments to how much can be done in a, in a short time with just enough focused concentration on, on the right thing. Absolutely. And, and the power of writing on the internet is, is not yeah. to be underestimated. Definitely. Totally. I will say too, we've talked to so many of these founders and asked them like who they're hiring. And it is just like really smart, hardworking people who have experience in something that is, that is difficult. And so like, if you're listening to this and you're like, I want to get involved, a lot of these companies are just hiring people who can get up to speed really quickly and learn really quickly. And I think that's true across a bunch of the different industries that we'll cover. So go read, I think, uh, Trace, Trace Stevens and Marky Wagner's Choose Good Quests, listen to Age of Miracles, get inspired. And then like, I think it is really possible to, to kind of get yourself up to speed in these industries and make a, make a, a contribution quickly. Let, let's wrap on that. The podcast is Age of Miracles. Uh, it's it's in the show notes. There's two episodes already that that are fantastic. Ch- check it out, and uh, we'll uh, we'll have to have you back on at, at some point, perhaps afterwards. Uh, Julia, Packy, thanks so much for for coming on. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric.